Welcome everyone to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. Uh, Paige, is, Paige, she is going to moderate our session today. Thank you, Billy D. Welcome, everyone. My name is Paige Shee, and I'm the Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. GTMI is one of 11 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes that uniquely focuses on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist our partners in moving their innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment located on main campus uh, for basic research, as well as nearby on 14th Street for applied research in the Advanced Manufacturing Pilot Facility, also known as AMPF. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, and thought leadership. GTMI hosts a Lunch and Learn series every semester, and this spring, sessions are held every Monday at noon as live online events. These sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, undergraduate and graduate level students, as well as researchers and our growing global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a smooth presentation experience, all audience members are automatically muted. If you do have questions or comments for the speaker, we encourage you to use the Q&A panel on your screen to submit those questions as they come to mind. And uh, we will collect all of those and address them with the speaker at the end of the lecture. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Aaron Stebner, Georgia Tech Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Stebner works at the intersection of manufacturing, machine learning, materials, and mechanics. Professor Stebner joined the Georgia Tech faculty as an Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science and Engineering in 2020. Previously, he was the Rollinson Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science at the Colorado School of Mines a postdoctoral scholar at the Graduate Aerospace Laboratories of the California Institute of Technology, a lecturer in the Seagull Design Institute at Northwestern University, a research scientist at Telezygology, establishing manufacturing and Internet of Things technologies for shaping memory alloy secured latching devices, a research fellow at the NASA Glenn Research Center developing smart materials technologies for morphing aircraft structures, and a mechanical engineer at the Electric Device Corporation in Canfield, Ohio, developing manufacturing and automation technologies for the circuit breaker industry. He has won numerous awards, including an NSF Career Award, the Colorado School of Mines Researcher of the Year Award in 2017, and a visiting professor fellowship from the Japan Society for the Preservation of Science in 2019. Dr. Stebner serves as a board member of the ASM International Organization on Shape Memory and Superelastic Technologies, and an International Advisory Committee member of the International Conference on Martin, uh, Martin Siddick Transformation. Dr. Stebner is an Associate Editor for the Journal of Additive Manufacturing. Welcome, Dr. Stebner. You may begin your presentation. All right. Thanks, Paige. Um, so, yeah, the, the work I'm going to talk about today is, is uh, entirely in collaboration with uh, Brandon Kappas, who was uh, uh, operations director in the center I ran at Colorado School of Mines and now has his own uh, company there, uh, KMMD.io. All right, so we can go to the next slide. Sorry, we're uh, we're out of sync today because my web sharing isn't working. So uh, I'll be saying next when we go through. All right, so the the first question we should think about um, in in any engineering problem, um, but but why or why would we want to and or why uh, what benefits could machine learning give us relative to conventional techniques? And so we have a recent uh, review paper out largely looking at this question um, that's cited there. And, and I would say we also, in, in Chapter 2 of the review paper, we tried to put in a section that um, kind of pointed people to some of our favorite tutorials and resources that we used when we were brand new to thinking about uh, machine learning for materials and manufacturing problems. So, so it's not just a review of what people have done in additive, but, but we tried to put some other resources there as well. So we can go to the next slide. And so if we look at a traditional additive uh, manufacturing problem here, we've got a diagram of laser powder bed fusion and the things that happened before the manufacturing process, in the manufacturing process, and then after. And if we just think about in the manufacturing process itself, 
and think about 11 common control variables listed in the table there, um, we can quickly arrive at 10 to the 9 combinations of experiments in a traditional design of experiments plan um, to map out that design space. And then if we think about an actual printer, if you buy, you know, what some companies call their advanced parameter set, you may actually have 140 things available to you to control. And so one of the most obvious reasons to want to, to use machine learning in metals additive manufacturing problems uh, next is one more yep it can reduce the time and cost of new development um and then behind that if so so we can use it for what's called sequential design of experiments where instead of doing all 10 to 9 of those com combinations and then looking at our statistical analysis or sampling them evenly or other strategies um, we can actually use uh, sequential updates of our statistical models through machine learning algorithms to tell us which next experiment will get us the most bang for our buck, so to say, or, or return on investment in time. Um, the second one there is, um, similarly, we can use it to improve and accelerate qualifications. So we can tell us, um, you know, if we're at a 95% confidence interval and we need to get to 99 for some process, um, it can tell us how to get there, which part of the design space is leading to our lack of certainty or variance. Um, it can also uh, statistically learn relationships that are physically undetermined in point three there. So maybe we have physics models for some part of the process, um, but there are some part of the process where we don't have models, but we do have data. And machine learning can learn functional relationships through the statistics in those data where we don't know the physics fully. Um, we can also use them as surrogates to physical models to make faster calculations. Um, and so that's a number four. Uh, number five, a uh, common one in robotics and, and also in manufacturing is to use them to improve or monitor our machine performances. So neural network control of a dynamical process to minimize vibrations or structural health monitoring applications. Uh, next one. Number six is um, they provide a means for solving inverse problems. And so typically our physics models and or um, calculations can solve the forward problem, but they become very costly if we try to invert the problem and, and do an inverse search. Uh, machine learning techniques are very amenable to that. Um, also, they're much more amenable to what, we, what we're calling sensor fusion technologies in Industry 4.0 which is not just using a temperature sensor um, to make a decision about whether or not the laser should move faster or slower, for example, or the robot, um, but actually trying to use tensor, uh, temperature signals, acoustic signals, visual signals, and all of these in tandem um, and interpret multiple sensors. Um, and, and statistics is one strong way to do that. And I think there's one more. Yep, then if we, as we look toward the future, um, and working towards artificial intelligent manufacturing and or development of manufacturing processes. Certainly machine learning algorithms and models will be the foundation. Uh, we then couple them with statistical algorithms for statistics-based decision-making um, to add the intelligence part. And one more click, there can be other applications, of course, um, that we haven't thought about yet too. One of the biggest open challenges in um, using machine learning in metals additive manufacturing or more generally materials and manufacturing problems um, is modeling across multiple data sources. And this is because we have so many different types of data sources that we use to make decisions in materials and manufacturing. We may use images to make decisions about the material or porosity. We may use, and, and those may be collected on the scale of seconds and length scales, anywhere from nanometers up to millimeters. Um, and then we may have a, a in-situ pyrometer for a temperature signal that's collected at uh, microseconds, but gives us one dimensional data, essentially voltage versus time, right? And we have all these um, different types of data with different length and time scales. And as humans, we learn over the course of a PhD or a career to make decisions by linearly interpreting all of these. So we know how to read one piece of data and decide how to use that knowledge when we look at the next piece of data and just keep compounding 
um, through our linear superposition uh, reasoning processes that we do so well. Um, but how to how to build a data space for a computer model to work in parallel and make statistical inferences is is not so obvious. And and I think one of the the bigger open areas um, that we need to work on and advance in research to better enable machine learning. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the talk as well. I'll come back to this idea. Uh, next slide. Another open challenge then is actually how do we build knowledge? So let's say that we could assemble that feature space for the computer. How do we get the computer to understand that some precipitate in the bottom right there at the 10 nanometer scale is essential to the strength but the chemical segregation we see at the 500 nanometer scale is essential to ductility and the porosity is essential to stiffness, et cetera. So it, it may be able to um, have statistical models, but to actually turn those statistics into knowledge that advance the field is another area where I think as uh, research scientists, there are a lot of opportunities um, to, to really have big impact. And next slide. Uh, yeah, and of course that all leads to the properties. Sorry, go ahead, go to the next one. But one of the, the necessary precursors, I think, before we can really make any of that impact is, is we're still learning as engineers largely to understand when, where, why, and how to use machine learning and engineering problems. Um, and certainly when, when we started the center, uh, Colorado School of Mines several years ago, we were in this same boat. We, um, and, and I think we've made some progress. And so um, if you haven't seen them, even if you're not planning to submit to the journal, uh, we published, I, I worked with several of the peer reviewers for the Additive Manufacturing Journal to come up with a set, kind of a rubric on understanding where, when, why, and how machine learning should be used and or if it worked or gave us anything useful that we could publish. Um, so the link's down there. And if we go to the next slide, Oh, I, I would say, yeah, stay here. Um, so it, a machine learning problem actually has many different steps. So stage one here is collecting the data. Two is curating the data. Three is featurizing the data. And then four is where the machine learning actually happens. And if you just click once, um, a lot of the journal articles on machine learning and engineering problems pre-2015 would come in only documenting stage one and the end of stage four. They would say, we have this data, we had this finite element model and a temperature sensor and some mechanical properties as our data sources. We used machine learning and it worked because we got a lower root mean square error. So they went straight from that gold box in one to the gold box at the end on the right there. And click one more time. We had no idea what happened in between, right? And so, this is where kind of this bad name or bad reputation of black box machine learning came about it is because you know computer scientists were developing the algorithms and, and writing about those and engineers were largely just picking up the algorithms and trying them and getting an answer and seeing that the error got smaller so it must be working but we knew nothing about how when where or why it was working just that some error metric was getting better and so if we go to the next slide what we what we have now is is kind of a a more systematic way to step through the process as engineers. Um, so, for example, you know, that, I, I kind of relate this to like we can look at it many different things. But if you think about finite element modeling, right? In the 1960s, if you asked somebody to review a paper, you really needed one of a small number of experts. But now you can ask almost any engineer um, that publishes to review a paper that uses finite element modeling. And they'll know to look, did the author say what software they used, what element type, did they do a rep mesh refinement study? And, and we know what information has to be there in a publication that used finite element modeling for us to be able to reproduce and or peer review the results. In machine learning, we're largely still learning what that essential information is. And so, and, and I would say also as an engineer wanting to use machine learning and research, we're still learning how to walk through that process um, this is a flexible process that, that we've put forth. If anybody has any comments or feedback, I, I welcome them. Um, we'd love to, the, the full document's about a page and a half. We'd love to revise it. 
Um, but what we see here, uh, based on our, our last five years of experience, is the first step is to clearly define the data space. So not just the data sources that we're drawing the data from, but how are we going to go from those data sources to the actual featureized data space that we're going to use for the machine learning model? So what are the inputs? What are the outputs? Do we have to clean the data? Do we have to interpolate missing values? Um, all of these types of things uh, need to be documented to understand um, if the right, if the data space that's chosen um, is, is structured properly for machine learning. Uh, one click. Number two, then, is to test that data space, that data set, once it's in the data space. Um, and specifically, uh, to use statistical models, there are two fundamental hypotheses that have to be tested. One is similarity, which says if I re reproduce that, do, do data points at similar points in the data space have the same value? If you had two data points right next to each other and they were very different, um, you, you'd largely be looking at wanting a deterministic model, not a, not a statistical model, and we'll talk about that in an example. And then relational, do the data across the data space relate to each other through some statistical measure that can be quantified? And, and we'll look at examples of this as well. Um, one more click. Step three then is to decide, is machine learning necessary? So once we know that our data space is described by machine learning, then we should ask the question, can I just use something like linear regression or a basic uh, empirical modeling of y equals mx plus b, for example, and if I can, why would I use machine learning? So there were a lot of journal articles coming out um, pre-2015 that would show that they used a machine learning method and it gave them the same answer as something we already knew. And I think for, for verifying that algorithms were out there, but now that, now that we kind of know this machine learning here, I think as engineers, we should really be using it to do problems that we couldn't solve problems that we couldn't solve otherwise solve without it. Um, and so uh, one more click. Then we need to perform a st statistical analysis to determine what kind of algorithms we should be using. So sometimes this is a qualitative analysis. For example, if we have lots of data and they're continuously varying values, we can use a regression model and, and be quantitative about our, our model. If we only have a few data and or they kind of only get are statistically supported in a few bins, then we want to go to a classification type algorithm. And, and we'll look at examples of both of these as well. One more click. Once we know which algorithms are our best candidates, then we want to use uncertainty quantification metrics to optimize the parameterization of those models and or if we have multiple candidates, select which one is the best performer for our particular problem. And one more click. And then we can um, assess that final ML model performance. And I think here, uh, what we're requiring in the journal now and, and what I require my, my researchers in my group is not just an error metric, but we really need to assess bias, accuracy, and variance in a, in a rigorous way, right? If, if we, don't have an understanding of all three of those things, then then we're perhaps overstating um, the uh, utility and um, of the machine learning model. And then finally, one more click. Uh, we should then document the scientific and or engineering impact derived of the machine learning. Um, so I think it's essential for us as engineers to not just show that the machine learning worked, um, but also to say, hey, how, how far did we advance the field by the use of machine learning? So this could be comparing against a previous physics-based model. It could be comparing against random guessing. It could be um, some type of quantification, maybe comparing against the last group that published an article on machine learning in this space and explaining uh, how what what new benefits the community can derive by using this new work. And so... Um, these are kind of our, our seven steps, and I'll, I'll kind of show you um, early examples in, in uh, my efforts here where we ran into frustrations early on in these steps and or just decided to cut a project because one of these didn't test out, um, and then also an example of a new, newer work where we were able to walk through all seven steps. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, that looks like backwards instead of forwards. Maybe keep going. Yeah. All right. 
Um, so one of the uh, first things we set out to do, uh, we started a center um, called the ADAPT Center, and, and it was kind of set out to solve data problems in metals additive manufacturing. And at the time, about five years ago, everyone was really concerned with porosity and how are we going to make sure there isn't some critical flaw in our part. Um, so we have a number of, of references there. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so we uh, go ahead and click a couple times. Sorry, the video is a little laggy there. Um, so our goal was we kind of came up with these common plates of coupons where all the parts were at different orientations and different locations. And the first thing we wanted to learn about was what were the effects of orientation and location within the build volume on the resulting porosity and mechanical properties for a single material printed in a single machine. And then we were going to add in the process parameter variation, so start varying the laser feeds, feeds, all those kinds of things. Um, and then one more click. And then finally, once we had those first models underway, we thought we'd then build up um, models across the models, as it were, start building higher level models across different machines and different materials. And so let's go to the next slide. And the big goal here was um, the industry academic uh, partnership, you know, if we had different companies in the center, each with different printers printing different materials, if they would send into the center generic things like tensile bars or compression samples um, that they printed alongside while they were printing their other parts, we could build up this non-proprietary database um, just around all these, the quality of all these generic coupons and build these models. And then when company A wanted to enter titanium, they could draw from company C's data set on titanium and lower the bar for, for getting there and getting qualified was, was the big goal. If we go to the next slide. Uh, yep, and so one of the first things we needed to do was be able to um, automatically analyze a lot of our data, and in this case, porosity data, right? So if you want to support machine learning, um, you need more than 10 data points, right? You, you'd ideally have thousands to millions of data points. Um, and so if we're going to start running thousands of X-ray tomographies, uh, we need to be able, and, and each one of those may have thousands of pores within it, we need to be able to automatically analyze those without having to have a student visualize each data set, count the number of pores, you know, say what their size are, draw boxes around them in some software interface. Um, so we developed uh, in a master's thesis a data pipeline for doing this, and, and kind of what you're seeing here is a comparison of serial sectioning microscopy versus the statistics in microcomputed tomography for the same sample. Um, so we, we kind of did a benchmarking there. Um, if you click again. Yep, and we could automatically populate a database with all of these calculated statistics about the porosity in each sample. Um, and then if you click again, and then more um, importantly, what we actually did was um, we used singular value decomposition on the data set um, in an algorithm to automatically uh, calculate basically the three eigenvectors of each feature in the tomography. And so we could just store, instead of having to store the visualization of the tomography, we actually stored matrices of every feature, its first three eigenvectors, as well as its position vector with it to the centroid of the geometry within the part. And that gave us a matrix representation of each of the pores or, or inclusions um, or both within the part that we could then use for machine learning down the road. It, it was already put into matrix form for us. And if you go to the next slide, and we showed that um, these calculated variables, like the square root of the of the magnitude of the eigenvectors, or the ratios of one eigenvector to the first eigenvector to the second eigenvector, could tell us whether these defects were keyhole-like defects, which are more spherical, so those ratios of the eigenvectors would be more equal, or lack of fusion or crack-like defects, which would be more planar. So eigenvector one and two would be similar, but three would be much smaller or other things. And so we were able to classify 
um, defect types using these matrices without having to visualize and determine visually with a human what types of defects were there. Uh, next slide. Yeah, keep going, go ahead. Yep, and so the next thing we noticed uh, visually as humans was that if we looked at the surfaces of these pins, oftentimes if there was a really bad defect inside, like on the right-hand side, we'd see really bad surface quality as well. So you can see the surface is much more uh, torturous around that, that bad defect at the top there on the right side than it is on the left one, which just has uh, smaller surface voids. And so we had another hypothesis that, hey, we can use machine learning between the surface roughness or the surface topology and the, um, to the porosity inside the part. And we can build a model that will allow us just with optical inspection of the surface to determine whether or not we've got a critical flaw in that part. And uh, I didn't go through all the details here. There's a master's thesis published on this. The, the takeaway is the statistical correlations were not strong enough between the surface flaws and the internal features. So it, generally it was true that if you had a big nasty defect, you would also have a big nasty defect on the surface, but the inverse wasn't true. There were other things that could also cause surface defects. Um, bad surface defects. And so if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, go ahead and just click through. Sorry, I forgot the animation, just click through. So we, with this project, we actually got stuck at step two, right? When we looked at um, similarity uh, hypothesis, it, it didn't check out, right? We, when we tested it for the inverse, you know, if, if they're similar, are they related? And the answer was no. Um, and so, um, at least for our data set, you know, that, that's one problem where we may like to use machine learning as engineers, um, but it, the, the data did not support it very well. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And so then what about our goal of modeling porosity as a function of spatial variation? So we build up a, a plates of these cylinders. We built multiple plates. Uh, go ahead and click like three times, I think. Just get these on here. So we used one printer, we used uh, the manufacturer provided material, we used their parameter set, and I think once more. And yeah, made the same geometry and all we varied was where they were and how they were oriented on the plate. And then we built multiples to test our similarity hypothesis. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Oop. Yeah, oh, and I do have the disclaimer there that it's not a geometry that they endorse. Okay, all right, go ahead. And um, the answer, right, came out that it was repeatable. We always had the maximum defect in the same part. You see that one, one part there having uh, like a one millimeter size pore and a couple having 700 microns pore. Those were always problem points in the build space and build orientation map, but they were statistical outliers. They weren't good for machine learning, it ended up, right? Because even though they were deterministic, and repeatable, statistically, they don't correlate to the main statistical distribution of the data. And so, you know, I was the engineer saying, well, what good's machine learning if I can't even determine where I'm gonna have a bad part? And the answer is, well, it, it's good for statistical things, right? And when you're looking at outliers that aren't part of the statistical distribution, um, then it's not so good, right? And, and that's not a problem where you should use machine learning, that's a problem where you should use uh, deterministic methods. Um, but the good news was the way we were able to um, go about it and, and actually, you know, was, was to change it from an attempted regression problem where we wanted to say how big the pore was, exactly what its effect on yield strength and modulus would be, and, and kind of get very quantitative. We weren't going to get there because they were outliers, but we were able to get to, to kind of a pass, fail, or check, it, check, check into this further metric for the companies. So kind of think about a green light, yellow light, red light. Um, just by turning these into classes and just binning everything that was 10%, every defect that was 10% or more, five to 10% or less than 5% of the size of the minimum feature. So these are two millimeter diameter pins and we draw the line there at 200 microns and 100 microns to make the classes. And that did give us enough data then to be able to classify when we would have a fail. Uh, based on position and orientation. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Yeah, that's fine. 
So the second thing we can do um, is instead of just building our models directly from the, uh, you know, the manufacturing parameters to whatever feature we're interested in, whether it's a flaw or, or strength or whatnot, um, we can start augmenting the data. Go ahead and click again. Uh, keep clicking, maybe one more, two more. Yep. Um, is we can calculate using relationships or transformations between the, the signals and physics, um, we can add data to the data set about the physics. And so in this case, we knew if the part was built with a certain orientation, it would have 600 layers and another orientation, it would have 400 layers. And we knew the recoil pressure based on where it was in the position of the um, the laser optic in the printer. So if it was out at an angle, we knew the recoil pressure was much different than it was if it was directly under the scanner. And so we started making these calculations and augmenting the data. And if you click to the next slide, uh, go ahead and keep going. Yeah. So as, as a way to, to go towards that machine independent machine learning model. So to start making more general machine learning models that would work on multiple machines, even though the machine parameters would each be defined differently depending on the manufacturer. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And so then we drew upon kind of the um, algorithms that uh, Facebook or LinkedIn uh, would use to connect you to your colleagues or to projects that they think that you might be interested in. Um, these are called semantic similarity algorithms. And so this is what we do with social networks here, right? Similar education, similar social circles, similar interests based on which ads you click on or what you buy off Amazon or whatnot. Um, these things can recommend friends or professional colleagues to you in the case of LinkedIn. If you go to the next slide, for additive manufacturing, we were able to look at similar machine settings, similar other aspects here, which may be porosity or strength or, or kind of those outputs, but then these calculated physical effects like recoil pressure, number of layers, uh, laser spot size, et cetera, were also part of that mapping. Um, and when we did this uh, kind of augmented similarity mapping, if you go to the next slide, what we were able to do was using that similarity clustered space, we were able to better sample from the outlier space. And so that zoomed up scale bar there from like 120 to 300 micron pores uh, the green there were our samples that we were able to take um, by first clustering things into similarity groups and then sampling the same number from each similarity group. So in essence, the outliers only had 30 samples while the main distribution had hundreds of samples. But we then forced ourselves to take data, you know, include data from 30 samples of each bin, for example, and, and we got a lot more representation from the outliers, then, and and that helped us really get to our confidence in our statistics um, and, and the tails of our statistics more rapidly than it would have had we used a, another design of experiments uh, strategy like a uniform sampling or a random sampling or or something else. Um, so if we go to the next slide, let's see. So yeah, go ahead and click a couple times. Um, yeah, one more click. Oh, no, keep going. Yeah. So the, the takeaway was um, this was really a, the similarity clustering using those things we knew a priori, like the laser recoil pressure, the angle to the laser, number of layers in the part, allowed us to reduce the number of experiments that we needed to have the same statistics as the full database by 30 to 60 percent. And and this project is kind of left off there. I think the next challenge is to show can it work inversely in a sequential learning where we don't know the whole database a priori, right? And so um, there's still a challenge here, I think, to take it to the next level um, that we're, we're trying to work out with a new student now. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, this paper just came out a couple of weeks ago um, of where we were able to go through all seven steps completely. And so uh, go ahead and click. Okay, so the goal here was um, if we have a lot of data published on pre-existing machines, say Gen 1 or Gen 2 3D printers, and now, you know, five years later, manufacturers start coming out with Gen 3 printers and 
they put more powerful lasers in them or they changed the powder delivery mechanism or whatnot, can we still learn from the data on the old printers when we start adopting these new printers? And so um, here we, we collected data from literature. Um, so in the bottom left corner there, we then uh, went through those first two steps of understanding the statistics in our data space, uh, clustering, you know, featureizing the data space for machine learning, not how it was reported in the print papers. And then we went over to the right hand column back down from top to bottom of optimizing different algorithms that were likely candidates and then picking the best candidates and then verifying the model. Um, in this case, we did that through cross-validation at the bottom right corner, but then we also did it by predicting brand new experiments on these new generation printers and physically seeing how well the machine learning predictions compared to what we actually got out of the new generation printers. And so I'm gonna walk through this example now. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, go ahead, yeah, click seven times, I guess. So here we're gonna look at step one, which is to clearly define the data space. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And so we here, um, we chose TIE-6-4 uh, laser powder bed fusion because there were a couple hundred uh, data sets rec reported in the literature across 70 papers. Um, I think the, you know, you can see kind of the parameters that were commonly reported across all the papers were the laser power, laser speed, laser energy density, hatch spacing, layer thickness, and the size of the powders used in the printer, right, as far as the input parameters. Um, and so other things may have been reported in some of the papers, but, but uh, part of the data cleanup process was to only to reduce to the things where we had fully dense data for this particular problem. Um, the other thing I'll call your attention to is the top left there. Uh, so there were uh, 30 data sets, or 30 papers using EOS M270 280 printers. And so one of the tests we're gonna do at the end is we're gonna make predictions for an M290 printer, um, which is their new generation printer. And we had no data sets from an M290 or no papers from an M290 in the database. And then if you look at the right-hand side of that same plot, there's one, data, one paper from a 3D Systems Pro X DMP 300, and we're gonna make uh, predictions on the new Pro uh, DMP 500. And if you look at laser power next to that in B, the 500 has a 500 watt laser, and note that most of our data are at 250 watts or below. We had one data point at like 375 watts. Uh, we had nothing above 400 watts. So, so we're gonna look at a new model of similar technology in the M290 versus the 280 and 270, but then we're also gonna push the machine learning and see how well it could help us get a set of parameters for a brand new printer that has a, a more powerful laser than any of our previous data as, as kind of a, can we extrapolate with machine learning type test as well. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And the second thing we did um, after we had all, all the data from, from all of those papers was we said, okay, what outputs are supported across all the papers? And you know, some may have reported strength or fracture toughness or other things, but the only thing that was really reported across all of those papers were the density of the samples and the hardness of the samples. And so, um, and when we looked at the statistical significance, we basically could divide density into two categories, one low versus high. And I think the threshold is like 98.5% dense, uh, given that this is mostly academic literature and not industry literature. Um, and then the hardness uh, we could classify as low, medium, and high. And we're gonna look at those classes here a little bit forward. But uh, for TIE 64, what you want are high density, medium hardness parts. If you get high hardness, the material becomes over and brittled and doesn't have the ductility uh, needed in applications. And so uh, this schematic here just kind of represents the, the mappings that we're asking the machine learning model to make from these pre-existing data. All right, let's go to the next slide. And the next step we did once we had the data uh, feature space assembled was we used a statistical algorithm to tell us uh, what the statistically supported classes or intervals were that we could use to build our model. So we didn't have enough data, you know, 270 data points 
with seven degrees of freedom is is not enough to do a full regression model. There there really wasn't enough variability um, in the data to support a full regression model um, over those number of data points. So we went for a classification model and we used statistics to tell us which, where we should draw the bounding lines for those data classes. So not only low, medium, high hardness, but we also binned the inputs. The laser power got binned 40 to 120 watts, 120 to 400 watts, right? And et cetera is how you read that table. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And yep, go ahead and click all seven. And so the next step was to decide if the data set was suitable for machine learning. So test the similarity and relational hypotheses. Um, and if we go to the next slide. And so one way to do this qualitatively is to start looking at scatter plots, um, lower dimensional scatter plots in 2D or 3D. Um, and what we're looking for is to see that there are at least some trends. And, and so um, here in A and B and, and even C, um, they're not necessarily linear trends, but there are definitely trends in the data in terms of high hardness to medium hardness to low hardness versus these different parameters. And once we feel good about that, we can go to the next slide and perform more rigorous statistical tests such as ANOVA to actually tell us how strong these trends are and if they are statistically significant in the higher dimensional space. And so um, we do this kind of for each of the different classes. So we take all the classes of the inputs and look at them relative to each class of the output. And then we repeat this in this case five times and make sure that each of the models we're going to want to build um, are statistically supported by the data. And so let's go to the next slide. And so then the question becomes, well, do you need machine learning, right? If, if, the, if you have these strong statistics, could you just use some basic statistic and, and get your answer? And so if we go to the next slide, um, we looked at this both for the high quality map, which is on the left here, and then if you click once more, the low quality map, and the answer is the, you know, kind of the green are scattered all over this space uh, where we would traditionally make a process map. So kind of the power versus hatch spacing, versus speed, um, and there are really no bright green spots in any one particular rhyme or reason relative to the bad, you know, the red spots or the blue spots. So we feel pretty good at least using the state of the art for process mapping for metals additive manufacturing and powder bed fusion, that we couldn't just find this answer by drawing a straight line in this particular problem. So we say, okay, it's, it's you know, at least suitable for you know, machine learning stands to get us more than we could have had we just made simple process maps. And so if we go to the next slide. All right, go ahead and get all seven again. Yep, sorry. Okay, so then we want to um, inform our algorithm selection and tuning. So if we go to the next slide. Um, again, we, we're in classification uh, problems, so we've automatically limited ourselves to classification algorithms. And so what we do here is we take, and, and then we also have limited numbers of data. So we really want to, um, that takes us to a more specific class, like a neural network probably is just gonna overfit our data if we get enough degrees of freedom in there to model the data. And so we, we limited ourselves to um, more Gaussian process-based algorithms like naive Bayes and support vector machines and logistic regression. Um, and we started um, using things like cross-validation, where we train the model on a certain fraction of the data and then test on the rest, and then mix that up. And then we also used uh, confusion matrix, so true positive versus true uh, negative, false positive versus false negative uh, comparisons to evaluate which algorithms were the best performers. And uh, or to, to optimize the parameters and the algorithms. And then once we did, the bottom right there is what we call a receiver operating characteristic. Um, and that's what we use to decide which algorithm was performing better than the others. In, in this particular case, um, all three are performing almost identically. There, there's a, you know, yeah, within statistical variation. Uh, that fraction that you see there, you can almost think of as a percentage of how well one's doing versus the other. So if it if it was perfect, that number would be one or 100%. 
And so you see they're all kind of at 90. But what we did then, if you click to the next slide, go ahead and go through all seven. So now we want to select which algorithm is our best performer for our final model. And if you go to the next slide, and so what we did was we actually looked at these characteristics over all of the things we were trying to predict. So high hardness, high density, high hardness, low density, medium hardness, uh, high density, et cetera. And then we calculated a statistic that told us which one of these algorithms performed the best for all of the different machine learning model uses that we were interested in. And so now if you go to the next slide, um, Yep, and then we had to document the scientific impact and go ahead. And so I mentioned, right, we're going to pick a, a printer that has a higher powered laser. Uh, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Yep. And um, so here, this is using that uh, new printer that has a 500 watt laser. Sorry, it was the 320A, not the, not the 500, um, but it does have a 500 watt laser. And the numbers you see there in black are interpolation, so that's 0 to 300 watt parameter sets. And then the ones in red are where we force the machine learning model to tell us parameter sets for going um, outside 300 to 500 watts using this new laser. And so 9 is like 325, 10 is 350, and I think it goes up to like 475 watts, um, something like that. And um, the interesting thing here, the left-hand side is predicting medium hardness, high density. So that's our good TIE 6.4. And that model actually worked pretty well. The density started to trail off at really high laser powers, um, but the hardness was, was pretty much spot on extrapolating. And part of that's because we've used in these models that are, you know, don't need high numbers of data um, and don't, you know, they're, they're, they're more robust in extrapolation. Um, but if you look at the right-hand side one, which is embrittled TIE 6.4, it does much worse. As soon as we start in extrapolating, uh, the density really trails off, and the hardness is kind of half right, half wrong in terms of our experimental validation, blind validation. Uh, the reason for that is the training data set has very few data points on bad TIE 6.4 relative to good TIE 6.4. <laughs> And so the takeaway here is if you really are going to embark on, as, as we as a community start to embark on machine learning, we need to start publishing these data in briefs or other ways to document our data where we publish the bad data points just as much as we publish the good data points because um, our, our machine learning can only know about the statistics that it's trained on. And if we don't get any statistics about what doesn't work, it'll never be able to tell us that won't work, right? And so that was one of the takeaways here. Um, if you click once more, uh, that was just the new model of printer, you know, that didn't have a new, la new high-powered laser, um, and, and it worked pretty well as well. Let's go to the next slide. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our vision for the advanced manufacturing pilot facility uh, that Paige mentioned at the beginning. Um, this is a, a facility set up for collaborative industry, government, academic research uh, with Georgia Tech researchers. Um, if you keep clicking through, we currently have about 20,000 square feet. Uh, Boeing has an office there, and we're doing robotic manufacturing, so composites layup, some other things, as well as metals manufacturing. And so this um, right-hand side kind of show of, of that plot shows where most of the metals manufacturing capabilities are. Uh, let's just click through in the interest of time here. Um, we're building a new wet chemistry and heat treatment lab right now. Um, we really, we, we have a uh, one laser powder bed fusion printer. We have an EOS S M280. Um, I think we have a 3D systems DMP350 or 320 coming online here in a couple months. Um, but most of our capability right now is in hybrid uh, additive. And so we have um, some Mazak machines. We have uh, three axis CNC where we took out the CNC tool and put in an arc uh, uh, arc welder, and then we have a true robotic WAM system as well with the six-axis arm. Um, and then if you go to the next page, our newest one, actually Optimec is here turning it on today, and we start training tomorrow afternoon, um, is a new directed energy deposition system that has powder, DED, wire DED, and CNC all in a controlled environment. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll go through these kind of quickly, go ahead and click and bring in the points. 
Um, so we have a CNC tool, we have a lens tool, and go ahead and click one more, uh, which is traditional Optimec capability, and click once more. And then we have added on in the third bay a uh, center feed Fraunhofer uh, wire laser welding tool. So the wire feeds through the center and the laser converges as a tripod at the focal plane on the wire. Um, and then there's a bed underneath. It can be three axis. We uh, go ahead and go to the next slide and just click through them and bring them all on for time here. So we can have five axis capability. We can preheat up to 820C. Uh, we have a back reflection suppression laser, so we can do reflective materials like copper and aluminum. Uh, go ahead and keep going. Uh, we have all four powder feeders populated, so we can do multi-material or uh, combinatorial alloy development work. Go ahead and keep going. Uh, we have two wire feeders independently controlled, so we can also do combinatorial or dissimilar material work uh, through the wire tool. Uh, go ahead and keep going. Yep, and we're we're collaborating with NIST and others on adding process monitoring sensors into the machine now. Uh, go ahead and keep going. And so future, what we want to look at is can we come up with uh, AI systems that span supply chains, so material, manufacturing, recycling, the whole bit. And so if you go to the next slide. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning, one of these biggest open challenges is how do you span multiple data sources, add constraints from the supply chain like time and cost. Um, and so I, I won't go into details here, but I'm working very closely with Syria Kaladindi and others here on how we solve these problems and come up with the methods we need just to be able to do step one of that algorithm and to construct the proper data space is one of the biggest challenges and understand the relationships between these things, right? And it's challenged us in multi-scale modeling for 50 years now, and it's challenging us in machine learning too. Um, but I think we have passed forward. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and so what we propose now, if you click through, sorry, go ahead, um, is to actually uh, build out, kind of renovate this whole space. And if you go, keep clicking through, um, go ahead and keep going. Sorry, no, yep, keep going. One more, one more. <laughs> Next slide, there we go. So we have a proposal pending now to actually turn this space into a national user facility um, where we have a, a ability to have full, full automation within the lab uh, where people can test and deploy their own AI and machine learning algorithms and or use the lab for optimizing some new material feedstock or accessing um, you know, the middle cells there, are what, what they're terming metamorphic manufacturing, which is uh, kind of local forging and forming of parts to get different microstructures and different properties graded across your part. Um, and we want to have the characterization tools, the manufacturing tools, all the way from, we're, we're not going to obviously have a mine there, but uh, being able to bring elemental uh, ore and thing in all the way through to recycling to be able to enable you know, I kind of looked at uh, the history of autonomous vehicles, right? In the first driverless vehicle, somebody actually took, you know, an, a 1925 car and made it a remote control car and, and drove it on the road, right? And, and it was reported in Time Magazine. And it's like, you know, we're 100 years later now, and we still haven't fully tested an autonomous vehicle on the road, right, without the ability for humans to intervene. And so I think if we're really going to get there in materials and manufacturing, we need to start having some early stage uh, kind of high risk laboratories that give us this ability. And, and certainly um, lots of colleagues are working on this, but but I think we're at the point where we need more than one machine and, and one you know mechanical tester, or one machine, one mechanical tester and one SEM. We need to be able to kind of reconfigure our data sources depending on the problem we're trying to solve and the answer we're after as engineers. And so um, this is something we're working on over at that facility uh, for the next kind of five to 10 year vision of what we could do over there. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, if you're interested, I've got a double header today due to some rescheduling. So I'll talk about additive manufacturing of shape memory alloys this afternoon in a material science and engineering seminar. And finally, last slide. Hopefully it's not too jittery, but uh, we all love to see the 250 piece additively manufactured TIE 64 Iron Man uh, flying on the Discovery Channel, right? So I had the privilege of actually uh, connecting with Adam Savage in 
having him work with our center at Colorado School of Mines uh, to print this uh, Iron Man for his uh, show, first show of his new series last year. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, important to realize what we could do if, if we keep working towards these bigger visions. So with that, I thank you for your time. Apologize for going over time, uh, but glad to answer a few questions and please feel free to follow up with me via email anytime. I can't hear you, Billy D. Hi, uh, Aaron, this is Paige. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Okay, we're still live. It looks like there's one question asking if the slides can be made available. Uh, yeah, you you uh, you have the best answer, right? You recorded the event. How do you share the event? Yeah, so we will we'll post a recording of today's presentation on the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute website, and so uh, participants should be able to see the slides through the video itself. Um, and then if there are, you know if there are additional details uh, or questions that audience members are looking for, I think the 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 best route is to reach out to Dr. Stubner directly. That's yeah. easy. Uh, and if there are any other questions, it looks like we have two minutes left in the hour. So if there are any other questions, I encourage uh, audience members to go ahead and submit those now in the Q&A panel. There is a slight delay before they show up on our end, but uh, please go ahead and submit those now. And I apologize for my video not working. I am here and we did test it uh, days ago, but uh, anyway. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it'll work this afternoon. So. Well, we really appreciate your time, Dr. Stebner, and uh, it was a fantastic presentation with um, really interesting detail. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank our audience, too, for joining today and encourage uh, you know audience members to visit our website. We should have the recording of today's presentation posted within the next day or two. So if you'd like to refer back to anything, please go ahead and, and visit our website. Um, and if you have colleagues or friends who are unable to attend today, please encourage them to, to visit the website and take a look as well. In addition, I would like to invite everyone to attend uh, our next Lunch and Learn session, which is next Monday at noon. And we will feature uh, Dr. Douglas Friedman, who is the Executive Director of the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, uh, Biomade. And he, his uh, lecture will focus on challenges and opportunities in bioindustrial manufacturing. And it looks like we're just at the end of our hour and there may be one additional question that has come in. Wanted to compare and simulation in a general sense. Yeah, so Aaron, are you able to see the question on your end? Yeah. Um, okay. We we use, uh, I mean, generally I think I think MATLAB is, has good machine learning algorithms if you're comfortable in there. We tend to use more Python-based packages uh, like Scikit-Learn and, and other things, but um, you know certainly there are well-proven al algorithms for both the Monte Carlo part and the ML part. And so the way you do the inverse problem is you first build your ML model, and then you use your Monte Carlo to probe uh, points in your design space to find local minima um, to do the inverse. I assume that's what you're after there. Um, but I'd, I'd be glad to follow up and, and talk more about that in an email. I think that question starts getting kind of specific to the, you know, what what the scientist or, or student is comfortable in programming wise, as well as the type of data and how big the data set is, as well as um, what question you're wanting to answer. So I'd be glad to, to talk further offline. Thank you, Dr. Stedner. And it looks like there's a lot of interest in uh, reviewing this presentation again. There was another question related to the recording. so. Um, obviously, a lot of great detail and information here, and it looks like we're at the end of our hour. So once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Sumner, and thank you to our audience members, and tune in next Monday at noon for another great lecture. Thank you. All right. Have a good one.